and welcome to Must See Films, a podcast that's helping you see films differently. My name's Darren, and in today's episode, I have a real special treat for you. And I cannot wait to share this conversation with you because today I'm going to be speaking with Rob Ager. This is a man who started the YouTube sensation of film analysis, known for his detail, his depth, and his film analysis videos on The Shining, Monolith Explanation of 2001, Full Metal Jacket, and many more. And just as a little background, I sent my first ever videos of Punch Drunk Love and There Will Be Blood to Rob, and he was very supportive early on, and I'm extremely grateful because I didn't realize at that time in my life how important those videos would be to me, and how Rob's work would influence mine and result in this kind of growing community of niche film enthusiasts that enjoy seeing films differently. So this episode, I believe that it shares another side of Rob that hasn't really been captured before. He's incredibly friendly and funny and passionate, obviously, about his work. I hope this conversation gives you a little glimpse into both our processes of breaking down films. And I hope you find little nuggets of applicable information that you can enhance your own love and experience of films. So without further ado, sit back and enjoy. Um, so Rob, I just want to say a big thanks for joining me here on the Must See Films community um, and sharing with the community. Um, and I think it's pretty safe to say if there wasn't a Rob Ager, I'm pretty sure there wouldn't be a Must See Films. And so I'm really excited to talk to you about all, so- all things film and all things film analysis. And I thought it would be an interesting point to start with to put this kind of interview into context is just talk about the, the format of film analysis videos. Because when I first came across your work, it was clear to me that not only was I interested in the films you were talking about, but the way in which you presented information in the videos, I thought was very intelligent and very smart. And I thought I could replicate that with a a few of my own favorite films. And so I just wondered if you could talk about how you kind of came up with that form to begin with. Oh, well, well, first of all, uh, nice to meet you, Darren, finally. (laughs) And um, yeah, I mean... Well, actually, the the format issue of it, it was kind of an accident. Uh, I was, I'd been shooting movies myself, uh, writing, directing, editing short films and stuff for years, and I ran out of money at one point. I, I was living in Manchester, a uh, big mistake I made moving over there for a while. And um, I, I didn't have any money to make movies, so I wanted to do something. And at that time, I was thinking, well, let, let's just study all my favorite movies, you know. And I was watching stuff like Alien and noticing all the sexual things going on in birth trauma uh, and The Shining. The first thing I picked up on that was the Native American stuff. And I was like, wow, you know, uh, but I wasn't looking for things. I, I was studying classic movies to help me with uh, how I would make my own movies. I wanted to break down the fine details of what's the best way to shoot a scene, best way to edit that that type of thing. And by studying those movies in depth, I started to accidentally come across these themes hidden in the details, and I, which I totally didn't expect to be there. Um, the whole idea of there ever being any kind of, um, you know, sort of hidden messages in movies that were outside of the overt plot, I'd never even thought of that before, really. So it was an accident, and I thought, I want to get the stuff out there. And... Um, <sighs> I thought about write, writing articles on it, but I was just getting into YouTube at the time, and I just thought this would be much better being done visually because the things I was talking about, you, it's okay saying them in the article, but if the person hasn't got the movie clip right there to show them, then exactly. it's just not going to sink in, you know. Um, so inevitably, it was going to be the, the the video format, and it's quite well compared to actually shooting your own fiction movies, it's quite easy to do. Uh, because you just need to take the DVD of the movie, transfer the footage, get it into a format that you can edit with, and have a microphone and record what you've written. You know, so I mean, it it is technically awkward to do. I'm sure you found that out as well. It takes a lot of time doing these these videos, but it's not nearly as difficult as actually making a movie yourself. So that was done as a, a sort of filler while I was waiting to get some money and to make some more fiction films. But then it took off online and I thought, well, let's run with this. 
Yeah, that, that's interesting because I feel like we've kind of came at it from a similar perspective in the way that for me, must-see films was really um, the process in my own kind of study of films with the kind of intention one day to make my own kind of low-budget feature um, and then to move into the kind of filmmaker. I thought to myself, and able to do that, you actually have to study and have a pretty decent knowledge of films. And so that's why I was so attracted to videos like things that you've made. But a lot of the study that I'd been doing myself had been in like film introduction books that I'd found in libraries and articles and so when I was introduced to your videos that was the first time that it took you know a, a video medium and then showed you um, in real time what was going on with the movie at a certain point and explained it in that specific way so just like you were saying it's just the best way to deliver and present that information that made so much sense to me and um, but it's interesting how you you came at it um, as a kind of sidestep from making your own kind of work yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose to an extent, um, I was probably a little bit influenced by things I'd seen before. I mean, it's all very well reading about movies in books, but because the formats are different, it's like there's a mismatch. Yeah. But, you know, as a kid watching, you know, Barry Norman doing film 87 or whatever, he's talking about movies that were being released and he would show clips and stuff, you know, that, you know, that was kind of fun because, you know, every now and then he would talk about aspects of the movie and then show you the clip and it's not nearly as in-depth as the kind of stuff that we're doing at the moment but it's a similar sort of thing um and alex cox's series video drone do you remember that one yes yeah yep yeah i mean that really opened me up to a lot of things as well you know we talk about movies like rumblefish and things like that and he'd go into a little bit more depth um, and there's an American guy. I can't, oh God, I can never remember the hell this guy's name. Um, <laughs> ah, he, he's a famous fella. Everybody would know him if I mentioned his name. But I saw uh, at one point he was doing a similar series to Video Drone, and he was talking about classic movies. And he did one on the Terminator. And um, you know he'd been talking about Citizen Kane and things like that. And he he just threw the Terminator in amongst his list of favourite movies. It was just, why, why the hell is he um, talking about that? But he started pointing out things like, uh, you know, the fact that the the Terminator smooths his hair in the mirror, um, you know, when he's putting the glasses on and fixing his eye and stuff. And it's like, you know, why would he fix his hair? He's a robot. He's not, he's not supposed <laughs> to have vanity. So, yeah, he was pointing out little things like that. And that, that was probably the first thing that I'd really seen that um, really made me think to look at the, the visual details in a movie. That's interesting. And I love the example of Terminator as well, because I feel like, I mean, you've made your own kind of low budget feature and I'm planning to do the same uh, this summer for me. Um, but Terminator is a great example of kind of like a guerrilla low budget filmmaking of James Cameron. And I love his story and the way he tells antidotes of how um, he created this film that is of such quality, but he kind of got around the money side of things and uh, solved a lot of problems creatively. So I love the film, The Terminator, but I love the story behind The Terminator as well. Yeah, it's a it's a marvelous piece of work. It still really stands up today. It does, and so I just wondered for you, how do you choose um, the films that you're interested in analyzing? Do you kind of ask for feedback from people, or do you just watch things and whatever strikes you? That's kind of what you move to next. Uh, generally, the films choose me. <laughs> that's uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like I say, you know, early, early on, you know, I was studying movies to try and find out how to make movies, and then certain movies started to reveal things that I didn't expect. Um, I know there's there's a lot of people, uh, I mean, I've seen your stuff, some of your stuff that you do online, and I really like it, and you, I think you were the only person I recommended when I did an interview for the New York Film Academy, and they asked who else's videos. You were the only person I recommended. But Thanks. I see a lot of Thank people you. try and do the stuff online, um, and it's very clear a lot of the time that what people are doing is they're picking certain movies that they like and then deciding there must be something hidden in this. Let's <laughs> find it. Or they've already decided what the hidden theme is going to be and then they start distorting the movie to fit into it. Yeah. Now, I know some people have accused me of doing that, but that's not the way I do it. You know, I deliberately try and set aside all assumptions when watching a movie uh, and just try and see what, what jumps out naturally, you know. 
Yeah, I think um, I think you got it right for me when you said that the films choose you because that's very similar to what I've said when people have asked me the similar question. It's because I feel like, I mean, you, you'll know this too, but in order to write a script that you're going to record and then edit all the video to, you have to really enjoy that film to spend so much time with it. So for, for me, it's been a film that um, has either hit me on an emotional level and I, I can see that there's more structure and form and narrative there that supports a lot of the things that are going on in the story and I'm attracted to it for that reason um or it's something that, that is very different but it's really hit me um either emotionally or just like viscerally and so for some reason i'm really attracted to that film and uh, watching it on multiple viewings isn't a chore and so every movie i've analyzed has been something i've really loved because you do spend a tremendous amount of time with it just to get to a, a 10 15 minute video maybe yeah yeah i mean um i mean i did one on uh Revenge of the Nerds last month. <laughs> yeah. And um, for some reason, that film had just stuck with me since I was a kid. I loved it when I was a kid. It was hilarious. And still to this day, it's just so watchable, you know. Um, so I've really started doing that. I've started uh, recently going back and looking at these classic movies that you just love to watch again and again. And especially the ones that when you put them on, you can't switch them off. You know, yeah. Revenge of the Nerds or even like Death Wish 2, which I'm doing at the moment. For some reason, those two movies, I can watch them any time and I can watch them right to the end without getting bored. And that says something about the, the quality of the movies, that there's something going on there that is a bit deeper, you know. Um, yeah, so, yeah, the films choose us. Yeah, and I've had that experience with E.T. as well. Like, E.T. was the first film I ever watched as a child and I've kind of been on a, a roller coaster journey with it because as I got a little bit older and I actually understood what was going on about seven or eight, it really started to scare me, that film. It's so intense. Mm. And then as I got older, I was kind of okay with it. And then as I got older again and I started to take on this kind of love for filmmaking, um, I came back to that film and just really got this new love for this film. And then I read your kind of article on E.T and it just opened my eyes again to like the layers and levels that is in that film since I've known it for like 20 odd years it seems yeah. to like keep giving you know it's a film that just like continuously seems to um, it is evolve. It's superb yeah yeah I mean um, I, I don't know if you've uh, seen it I did have a, an analysis of E.T. on YouTube it's it's now only on the DVD sets but yeah I'd watched that a while back a yeah it's about a 40 odd minute video um, but it's one of those rare examples where a movie has come out that you know has had massive commercial appeal and the filmmaker about 10 or 15 years later has come out and said oh actually that was all about my uh, problems with my my father and the possibility of him leaving and the family break up and this that and the other um, and I actually I got an email off a director in Hollywood a couple of years ago who is not a very famous director he'd done a few movies but he'd been mentored a little bit by steven spielberg and he told me that spielberg had personally told him that et is at least partially an allegory of the wizard of oz uh, so you get various bits of imagery in the film related to the wizard of oz with the uh, the rainbow blinds and the uh, i think there's a a blimp scene on the wall in the, the daughter's bedroom things like that you know um That's so yeah et is a great example for the for, for the fact that it's been admitted that that is deeper content. Yeah, absolutely. And so I just, I'd be interested to know for you, what were those films growing up early on for you that made you fall in love with cinema, that made you kind of want to study it as an art form and want to make films yourself? What were those films that jumped out for you? Right, okay. Uh, Blade Runner spring, springs to mind. Nice. Um, I was obsessed with that film for a couple of years in my teens, just thought it was just stunning. Um, just... I never had any sort of intellectual breakdown of it. I just thought the atmospherics and stuff were just amazing and the, yeah. the concepts. It, it just Certain movies that got me thinking a lot. Every time I saw Blade Runner, it made me ask new questions, wonder about new things. Space Odyssey, uh, The Shining, scared the hell out of me as a kid. And it probably took me about 20 years before I finally sussed out the... <laughs> The set design thing with the impossible layout of the hotel for all those years that had been playing on me and I didn't realize it. Um, so, what else? so did you, did you watch The Shining like, as a child? Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> it, see, the thing is, I mean, my dad, he was a really big film buff, and you know, we were one of the first families in our neighborhood to get a VHS uh, machine, yeah. and 
So he started recording all these Hammer Horror films and everything, but and they they scared the hell out. So he stopped showing me those. But then when I was seven years old, video stores opened um, in Canada where we were living at the time, and um, he brought home the very first two VHS movies we ever rented, and we watched them both on the same day. It was Alien and The Shining. Nice. So that was one of the best viewing experiences I ever had in my life, watching those two movies at home. Um, yeah, to- totally amazing. Um, but, I mean, other movies that sort of played on me as a kid and got me interested was, uh, I mean, you mentioned The Terminator before. Yeah. Um, uh, Aliens was, I mean, everyone loved Aliens when that film came out, you know, it was a big action movie and stuff. But there was a documentary on there, on TV here in Britain, which was um, a behind-the-scenes making of Aliens. And I saw that before I saw the actual movie. Oh, it was okay. about an hour long. And um, it was the first time I'd ever really watched a documentary that showed a director really speaking a lot about what he was doing and showed a lot of the actual film and process. And it was fascinating. That one really got me interested in filmmaking. Before that, I mean, I just thought of movies as something that somebody wrote as a script um, and then the actual concept of how it was filmed it never really entered my head I'd never really seen any footage of people making movies so Aliens was the first time I saw that yeah. uh, and watching Cameron direct I thought oh that's that's the guy it's the director that's the guy who, who, who brings it all together and I thought that's yeah that's what I want to do yeah that's funny. I remember watching when I was really young. It's nothing as great as Aliens, but I remember watching this um, uh, Jackie Chan um, stunt um, video, and it was basically like a television program on the BBC, and it was like an hour and a bit long, and it was Jackie Chan explaining with his stunt team um, how they worked together to perform all of the stunts that they would practice and then perform in the films. And it was like... I mean, Jackie Chan is always great value for money. He's just like tremendous, the, yeah. the, the athletic feats that goes into his films. Um, and and basically it was it was showing you all these things and it was very interesting. They had a lot of fake glass that would smash and that would make things look dr- more dramatic. But it was basically repetition. They would basically just do things again and again until they captured it once on camera and then that would be the one that they would use. And mm-hmm. it's just a very distant, different system to filming that they have in the West compared to the East. And they just have so much more time in the East and they take time over their process rather than some of the speed that you have to kind of film at, um, at other places in America perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jackie Chan is, uh, he's fantastic. I'm a big fan, you know. I mean, uh, Police Story, the first yeah. one. <laughs> totally loved it, you know. It must have been so much fun to make. But also, I mean, the, the fact that um, the scripts were hilarious. I mean, even if you took all the action scenes out, they're still great comedies. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, and that's even like even with um, a lot of stars, like even Arnold Schwarzenegger was the perfect role for him to be in um, in Terminator. But I actually really enjoy him in the first Predator film as well. There's something oh, yeah. really visceral and just hardcore about that film, and I enjoy yeah. returning and watching that film now. Yeah, yeah, it's, Predator's fantastic. Very nicely shot as well. Yeah, and but and it's actually very smart because the director um, who made Predator, I think, is also the director that made Die Hard. Um, and I think it's so smart that he was able to make an action film. Um, but it wasn't just the way that he presented the action film. It was the way that he created the space so that you would get um, used to you're in this one building, you're in this jungle, and you create this feeling of claustrophobia. And I think it, it doesn't it gets overlooked, the, the, the feat that he accomplished to be able to sell action films that kind of give and give again and, and are classic. Yeah. yeah, it's an art form. Yeah, action movies are an art form, definitely. Yeah. And so I just wonder for you, moving from the films that you loved, um, how did you kind of start your, your, your work on YouTube? So I know you said you were making films and then you did this as a side project, but were you already involved in YouTube before that? No, I wasn't. Um, I specifically started using YouTube so that I could upload the videos. I wasn't even really in the habit of watching anything on YouTube. I mean, I, I would look at stupid uh, things, you know, joke videos people would put up, you know, 10-second clips that my friends had told me about. But I never watched any documentaries on there or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was probably more into the downloading with the Napster and everything beforehand, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, still to this day, I don't spend a lot of time watching things on on YouTube myself, unless there's something specific that I'm going looking for. 
Um, it's very rare that I'll just go on YouTube and just wander around and look at random videos. I don't really have the time for it. Yeah, it's very. It can be very time consuming. Um, but one of the things I think about YouTube is how much it's evolved in the last like couple of years. I would say, um, just the fact that it used to be a place just full of you know funny cat videos and stuff like that. But now it feels like there can be like a real community and culture on certain channels, and there can be like some real educational purpose to some channels as well. And I yeah. feel like you can actually learn a whole bunch of things that you would first have to go to to uni to study some of these things that you can actually get some of that education. Um, through the right people on YouTube um, Absolutely. and yeah. so for people coming up now so like young kids coming up now um, they can discover some of the things we've made and discover things elsewhere like the filmmaking knowledge that they can have at their fingertips is just like incredible I wish I kind of had these things when I was <laughs> younger too you know oh yeah I mean I, mean, I didn't get started in uh, making my own films until my late 20s I think I was 27 when I wrote that first script and shot it the next year but um you know i didn't have any youtube before that uh, basically uh, filmmaking although it was something i always wanted to do um before the internet came along and before all the digital cameras came along it was something that people only did if they came from families that were rich enough to send you to university i wasn't one of those people so i had to wait until the technology caught up yeah um there was something i was going to mention about the the youtube thing there uh, the community thing yeah, I, I, I found it really uh, useful myself, uh, you know, in an unexpected way. Uh, some of the early videos that I did um, on film analysis, uh, they, they weren't nearly as thoroughly researched as the ones that I do these days. Um, and the comment sections are great because there's so many people. I mean, some of them are a bit nasty, but a lot of them are really nice. People who come in and just say, oh, you forgot to add this or you got that fact wrong and blah, blah, blah. And it really sharpens you up. Um, you start to realize, hey, I need to be a bit more thorough about this. And those people, even the trolls, they've <laughs> helped me over the years to really get things down specific and make sure that everything that I'm putting in the videos is backed up with some sort of documented evidence. Um, yeah, so it, it helps quite a bit. Yeah, I would agree with that, definitely. I wish, I, if there's only thing I could wish now, I could, I would wish I could go back to some of my early videos and make some of the audio better on some of them because that's, yeah. that's the thing that some of the people comment all the time and I feel like I made them so long ago now that um, I've kind of forgotten about them and they still kind of exist and people find them at different points and if it's the first video Def they've... Definitely. Yeah, like if it's the first I mean, video they've seen of mine, I'm like, oh, it doesn't really sell me how, <laughs> how it should be. Yeah, it's a, I wonder if it's like a confidence thing because I, I know like when I started off doing this stuff, I, I, I just sort of seen it as an experiment. I thought a lot of people aren't going to like this. People are just gonna, probably going to tear it to bits. And so I didn't really put much enthusiasm with my voice and my voice was totally monotone in the videos. Even at the best of times, my voice is monotone anyway. Um, but gradually over the years, I, I have been sort of slowly... Um, trying to put more effort into, you know, get get some life into my voice for the videos. Um, uh, you know, especially recently, I've, I've also started trying to add a lot of humour in uh, to spice things up a little bit because, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's all very well doing all this sort of academic style film analysis, but it, I don't, it it's not me. It's not actually me. I mean, I've, I'm actually a big fan of like the Three Stooges, the Marx Brothers, Laurel and Hardy, of classic comedies. Um, I like insane humor like Monty Python and stuff like that. And anyone who ever goes for a drink with me in a pub is going to be like, fucking hell, you're a bit wacky on the sense of humor. And that never comes across in the videos. So recently I've just started to bring that through a little bit. Uh, hopefully it won't spoil things for the fan base, you know. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's definitely funny how you, you almost like find a bit more of your personality as you kind of come through. Um, but even on some of my earlier videos, I feel like definitely confidence wise was lower. And then even the audio recording equipment, I didn't really know what I was doing as much. So some of them do sound uh, pretty poor to begin with. But then yeah. like what you'd mentioned before, a really good point I want to underline is that the comment section of some of these videos are actually so useful and so helpful. Um, like I did a kind of podcast 
um, on Under the Skin recently, the Scarlett Johansson film. Um, oh, yeah. And it was basically just my thoughts of, of having just seen it. So it was like an, a download dump of everything I kind of thought about that film. And people just started adding things in the comment section. And so if you coupled the video with all the people who had left feedback in the comment section, together with those, you actually had a really good information and bundle yeah. of information on this film. And so I feel like if people don't read the comments on this, they're kind of missing out on half of the, the feedback from people. And that's, it was a joy to hear back from somebody, you know? Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's also great that um, even though you can look back at the early videos and think, oh my God, that's sounds terrible that's edited bad and stuff like that still people enjoyed it yeah. and you know th there was people who weren't bothered about it and saw through it i mean some of my early stuff uh, you know there, there was hundreds of thousands of viewers, and i'm thinking why are people how are these people not complaining about my voice and and what and hardly anybody did um i mean i, I thought there'd be a lot of people saying oh you're a scouser you don't know anything um because <laughs> you know you get that attitude around britain in certain places I haven't found that hardly at all online, you know. Yeah, but it's funny because like if you look on some of the stats of like where where are people looking to your video from, you realize that you know in your day to day you're in you're in Great Britain, but when you're online you're talking to this like international community mm -hmm. of people, and so they're listening to you from all over. Um, and one of the weirdest things with it being like a YouTube video, I'm always torn between like, do I make videos that are a bit longer and that are the kind of videos that you kind of sit and have to watch? Or do I want to make shorter YouTube friendly videos that are more kind of bite sizable? And so I feel myself getting torn back and forward between these yeah. two different things. I don't know if you yeah. found that. Well, uh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I, I know like, um, basically at the moment I've tried to settle between bouncing back and forth between the two. Yeah. Um, I mean, I did a video a couple of months ago that was probably the fastest uh, growing video I've ever had in terms of view count, and that was the, it, it was a three minute video, it was something like 11 interesting things in the matrix, oh, yeah, um, yeah. and tons of websites, media websites, you know, very popular media websites, they all covered it, um, and they, you know, there was a fair bit of praise for it, and it racked up something like 300,000 viewings in about a week or two. Um, and that, that broke the record for me. The previous record for me was the uh, Spatial Anomalies in the Shannon video. I think that got about 100,000 in one week. Um, but what I found quite interesting about that was that, um, okay, it was a bite-sized video, and it really caught on, and a lot of people watched it, but it didn't actually bring me a lot of new subscribers. Right. Um, a lot of people just go, oh, that's interesting, and they move on. Um, so I'm not as keen on doing the bite-sized videos anymore. I'm still going to do them from time to time, um, providing it's something that I actually feel I want to do. I mean, that's an important thing these days. Um, a lot, lot of people are asking me specifically, can you do this video? Can you do that one? When are you going to yeah. do Fight Club? When are you going to do this? And I will only do the ones now that I feel passionate about. Um, and I've found time and time again that when I'm making a video that is something that I'm genuinely really interested in for myself, rather than just doing something that I think the fan base want to see, um, the response is better. I, I think people are smart enough to know when you really mean what you're saying and what when you're, the video that you're doing is something that you genuinely believe in as opposed to something you're doing just to boost up the view count so i really trust in that now yeah oh absolutely you can't really fake sincerity about things like that um i feel like i've had a similar thing with um i felt like for a while i had to make especially doing the podcast i had to make um timely videos so if there was um, a film coming out i felt like i had to review it quite quickly and then i kind of realized i was turning into more of a film review thing and that's not really what i yeah. wanted to do at all and so i've made a conscious decision to try and make um timeless videos rather than timely videos and yeah. so to, to cover films that uh, films that will really stand the test of time and put effort into videos that if people watch it 500 years from now it'll still say something meaningful about whatever the film is definitely, and, definitely. So, and so that's i want to try and leave some sort of body of work here that's um as a whole the channel could be quite useful to somebody if they're studying films for the first time and so i've kind of floated away from from doing timely videos um because like you were talking about you're just trying to rack up views you're just trying to get clicks and stuff and if that's your main like impulse then i felt like i kind of lost the passion for for the main reason i started the channel you know yeah, I mean, looking at some of the uh, other YouTube channels, uh, occasionally I'll come across it. You 
So there's lots of people doing various types of film reviews, film analysis and stuff online. And sometimes you see somebody who's got like 2 million views for a film analysis video, um, such as, uh, what's that, The Shining Code. Have you seen that? <laughs> Which one is that? Is that the, the numbers it's, and stuff? It's, it's on for about two bloody hours. I think there's a Shining Code <laughs> 2 and 3. And I don't know who the hell's done it because they don't put the voice on the video. They don't announce who they are. Um, it's just um, a lot of text put over the Shining movie, making various claims about the movie. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it seems pretty ridiculous to me. But it's got like a million or something views. Um, but often I find with these channels, okay, they might have a million views for one video, but then you go to the channel and they've got like about 3,000 subscribers um, rather than like 50,000 or something. And you think, well, hold yeah. on, they just had a one-hit video that did nothing for them. Um, and also it depends what kind of audience you want to reach. Um, I mean, I'm losing interest a lot in the the people who just want a bite-sized minute or two of, oh, that was cute, you know, entertainment. Because yeah. you know that it's not, they're not going to do anything with it. It's not going to, they're not going to be involved in filmmaking or anything like that. Uh, they're just passing time. So that's not the audience that I want to go for. I want the people who are really interested in learning about things, whether it's movies or whether it's certain subjects that are being covered in the movies that I'm talking about. Um, yeah, pe people who are going to take on board what is shown. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I feel like some of the best success I've had with the channel is people that have kind of emailed me separately and then just, I'm sure you'll have had the same experience where they email you and they almost like open their heart to you and they say, yeah, yeah. this this film that you've covered here has allowed me to see this film in a different way and then that film has kind of changed my life in some way. And so <laughs> various kind of emails, it's a similar to that and it's um and I feel like if, if that's the kind of thing that you can do through your videos, then there's almost less value in doing those kind of short minute things because if you can rack up loads of numbers that doesn't um, necessarily have the same impact as, as something that's sincere would um, yeah. and since we're talking about film analysis videos I just wondered from you um, what's your kind of process like from from watching a film that you're interested in to like final video what kind of steps do you take along the way to kind of break something down uh -huh. well um, I'll tell you some of it I don't tell everyone absolutely everything yeah well just wherever, <laughs> you're, honestly, wherever you're happy to share it's just funny this because I get people um, emailing me saying I want to do what you do <laughs> <laughs> Can you show me how to do it? I'm like, well, no, it's took me a long time to learn this. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, okay, first of all, the, the, the thing of the film chooses you, as you already mentioned. Yeah. Then I'll give that film another casual viewing or two, and you know, some ideas will start to form um, as I'm, I'm, you know, I start looking beyond the obvious dialogue narrative and just. Um, waiting to see what kinds of themes start to stand out. I'll pay a little bit of attention to the background scenes and so on. And usually a few things will pop out at that point and I'll go, ah, there's, there's the starting point of a, a film analysis. Um, if nothing ha like that happens, then I usually just move on from the movie and say, oh, well, there's not much there. Yeah. Um, if a few things have popped out that are interesting, um, things that are clearly, clearly have been done, uh, as an an additional element uh, beyond the obvious plot, um, then I'll start to do a, a serious breakdown, see, shot by shot, scene by scene of the movie, and you know, I'll have a pad of paper and a pen, go through the movie, watch it bit by bit, just looking at everything, listening to everything, making notes, um, and then the complex bit comes along. You know, I'll, I'll usually have quite a a long selection of notes. And some of the, the things that are on that, that list of notes, uh, you know, breaking down the movie, will be things that have clearly got some sort of value for a film analysis. And other things will be incidental things that I'm just wondering about and probably add up to nothing. Um, but then the complex bit comes where I take all those notes and I have to cross-reference them all and, you know, see which patterns emerge. And you might find, oh, on page five of my notes, I made a little note about this. And it popped up again on page 10 and on 12 and on 15. And then I put those together and it's like, oh, hold on, we've got four instances of this particular metaphor popping up in this movie. Are they deliberate? You know, um, so then all my notes get separated out into categories of things, you know, uh, and then I, I write the full film analysis from that. Um, 
it, there's quite a lot of detail that goes into the cross-referencing thing and, and the actual writing, probably too much for me to explain right now, if I could actually explain it all. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's great. No, thanks for sh- for sharing. I don't know if you've had the same, the same experiences where people um, would ask you to analyze a film and then you either know the film or you watch the film and then you know instantly that there's this isn't a film that is worthy of film analysis. Have you ever had that experience? Mm. Yeah, it happens a hell of a lot. Um, it, it, in fact, it was happening so much that I actually put a handful of movies listed on the, the fact page of my site explaining to people why I'm not doing analysis of those movies. I mean, I kept ask, people kept asking about The Dark Knight, and I'm like, it's fucking crap. <laughs> you know, sorry, sorry, Nolan fans, but it's a fucking crap film. Pardon my language. Um, I've watched it a few times. I've really tried to get into it, and it bores me to hell. Um, it, it's a guy in a bat suit with ears. You know, surface plot-wise, I'm not into su- superhero films anyway, unless the comedies. I like the Hellboy movies, uh, and I like the early Superman movies as well. But I don't like these superhero films that try to be all dark and, and stuff. It just It's too much of a mismatch for me. Um, I know there are some aspects of like the Dark Knight uh, to do with uh, perhaps you know elements of the War on Terror and things like that, but it's too fuzzy for me. And actually, like you said before, you have to actually love the film in the first place to do the yeah. film analysis. Um, so yeah, a, a film can have depth to it, but if you don't like the film, it's no point in doing it. Um, there have been quite a few other movies that keep pop- popping up time and time again. Prometheus. Uh, which I do like. I'm one of the people who does like that film. I don't like everything about it, but there's enough in it there for me uh, to make it a you know a worthwhile film. But we're still waiting for the follow-up movies to come along. I mean, what's the point in trying to analyse that movie when it's it's clearly designed to be part of a longer story? Um, yeah. And even if I did have the answers to what Prometheus was all about, would I want to come out and say it? when the sequels haven't been made yet because I'd be spoiling it for, you know, I'd, I'd rather wait until the, the other movies come out yeah, oh, I agree with you. And I feel like your, your your process is quite similar to mine. And I've had people who have emailed me also and said, I, I really like what you do. How, how do you break down a film? And I've made the opposite problem to what you said is I've listed the whole process for somebody once and emailed uh, it to them and said, if you do this and then you do this and then you do this, uh, and th- that's it. And then they're just saying, well, yeah, I know that. That's, that's of course you would do that. And I was like, oh, well, I just gave you all this information. Um, but what I, what I would recommend for people if they want to actually understand and a film better is nothing really replaces uh, multiple viewings for me and I feel like the more that you watch a film over and over especially if it's a film that you already consider to have some depth there'll be so many decisions so many like narrative and imagery decisions that will be based in to support the story um, and especially if there's more going on in the background is you just don't catch all of that on your first view and you know you'll get like a surface level feeling on your first viewing um, but really all of that detail you need to kind of soak up over time and that's really why Kubrick films have taken so long to appreciate is because there's just you need to years of watching those films for it really to come alive to you and so I would yeah. definitely recommend it's, it's almost multiple like, viewings yeah you have to have uh, the whole movie in memory <laughs> all at once you know so that so that your brain can sort of cross reference and you know the various scenes and connect up this with that um yeah, and as you say, the multiple viewings, it, it sort of embeds the entire movie in your mind so that you can do that. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like and I feel like it's just like so essential because for filmmakers to spend years on a script and then years bringing a film together and then post-production and then the, the visual scope of what a film's life actually is um, and then you watch it on your first viewing and feel like you've consumed the whole thing, it just doesn't make sense to me, you know? Definitely. Well, there's, there's a lot of uh, mental laziness, basically. Um, I, I find a lot of the trolls are basically people who get really annoyed because they thought that they could just totally get movies just by just casually watching them a couple of times. And, oh, yeah, I get that movie. No, you don't. You know, <laughs> If you've ever actually been on a film shoot, just filming one scene, you've got all the dialogue, you've got the costumes, you've got the set designs, the props. And it, there's so many things just going on in the filming of one scene. Um, and even if you're not 
putting hidden messages into a movie or anything like that. If you're just shooting by the script, even then it's really complex to do. And there's a, a thousand things that can go wrong on set at once that you have to plan for. Um, you know, multiple takes and all that kind of thing. And it, just the amount of work that goes into it is incredible. And the end product is very, very complex, even for a straight narrative film. Um, yeah, so I, I think a lot of people don't want to deal with that you know it's just like oh I, I don't want to sit down and study things I just want to let my instincts tell me what it's all about and then trust that that is as good as anyone else's assessment uh, so you get that type of thing yeah yeah and it's funny because sometimes filmmakers intentionally take that um, initial impulse and then misdirect you and then so allow so many people to believe that one thing is true and then if you actually look at the film closer there's something in there that con contradicts the entire film um, and so I've seen f filmmakers use some of that um, expectation against people you know yeah yeah I mean it's funny because like um, I mean I've got Death Wish 2 in my head at the moment because I've been studying that for the last week or two and uh, I've been reading through I mean as an example of the the, the kind of uh, you know more extensive research that I'll, I'll do these days I've got um, I've got multiple versions of Death Wish 2 you know because it was cut in various countries um, I've got the book Bronson's Loose, The Making of the Death Wish Films by Paul Talbot that's got some interviews and stuff I've got Michael Winner's biography so it's not just a case of studying the movie, it's a case of gathering lots of information from other sources about the production history, yeah. so that when you, when you look at the film and you say, I think this was done for that reason, you can check these other sources. Sometimes it verifies what you're thinking, and sometimes you find out it's something else. Um, but one of the things I found with um, like Michael Winner was quite open um, about his filmmaking techniques and stuff, and he does mention in his biography there at one point that um, if he makes a commercial movie and only 15% of the audience get what he actually wanted to say beneath that surface narrative, then he's happy with that, you know. Yeah, and that kind of reminds me of something that Quentin Tarantino had sens said once where if he makes a film and like 100 people watch it, he hopes that they see that they see 100 different films. And it's just like the fact that films are so subjective, the fact that we would all see the same thing and assume the correct thing, um, it's just not how film works really for me, you know? No. Um, and so since we're talking about filmmaking a little bit, I just wanted to speak about your own filmmaking experience and then um, you're dealing with kind of creativity. And, and so I just wondered for you if you're planning to make a feature or if you're planning to make a short film or some sort of artwork or creative project, do you have something that you do that helps you um, get into a creative place? Do you have any like rituals or places that you, sacred places you go? Um... I'm very lucky in that respect uh, because I'm able to switch that creativity on just about any time, anywhere. I don't know why I've always been able to do that. As a little kid, you could give me pen and paper and I would start drawing pictures anytime, anywhere uh, and just come up with something imaginative. Um, I think it was because of all the crazy sci-fi movies and things I was always watching as a kid. So yeah, I, I was always drawing robots and aliens and shit like that, you know. Um, and then I started uh, writing short stories in my teens and uh, I think because my imagination always just went so wild as a kid uh, I've always got like a thousand stories sitting in the back of my head anyway so it's not like I have to think something up I just have to tap into stuff that's already there that has been floating around in my head for years it's quite annoying actually because I can't even I can't get the time or resources to actually do one percent of the creative ideas that I have it's really annoying I just wish I had millions of pounds to just spend on all these different ideas <laughs> um, let's see uh, I know a lot of people have trouble with you know, things like writer's block and stuff and um, I would say that the major thing that holds people back creatively from my past experience of working on movies I mean like when I've um, directed movies I've had a lot of people working on the sets with me who were academically trained in film and I'm not and their confidence level would often be really low um, in terms of wanting to make films themselves it's like they, they had this idea oh if I just if I'm just the prop man on this set do that and then I just do the camera work on that set and then I do this and then I do that eventually I'll build up the confidence and the experience and the knowledge to be able to make a film myself yeah, 
And a lot of people spend like 20, 30 years in the film industry running around doing those tiny little jobs and they never ever get the confidence to do anything beyond it. Um, and I think the basic problem is the fear of criticism, the fear of yeah. failure. Um, you've got to allow yourself to fail, allow yourself to do things wrong and badly. And when other people come along and point and say, oh, well, that was crap, you just say, well, so what? You still learn from the experience anyway. It teaches you what not to do next time. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, again, going back to my dad, he was a very adventurous guy. He would go out and try all kinds of things in life. He was always trying different business ideas. And, he, I mean, he had to go at writing books at various points. We would rent VHS video cameras and make our own movies at home. Um, you know, we do comedy reenactments of things like The Exorcist and Psycho and things like that. Nice. Um, so we, we were always messing around with creative things. And there was always an atmosphere amongst us in the family that it didn't have to be done the right way as long as you have fun trying. And, and in the process of trying, you learn things where, you know, even if the, what you create is rubbish. Um, I, 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 it's weird because I, I do... Any filmmakers I ever meet in person who ask me about that, I always say to them, you have to deal with this fear of criticism. Let yourself make the mistakes. Go and make a crap movie. When you make your first short film, it is most likely going to be crap. So you might as well do it now and get it out of the way um, and learn from it and then do another crap one and keep making crap ones until you start to notice that they get a bit better. You know, um, Otherwise, you spend years and years planning to make your perfect first film and then you get extremely disappointed. You know, um, So people should actually go out and actively do crap creative things. Um, they should seek it out. Seek out failure. <laughs> you know, um, Take that approach and you'll very, very quickly learn. No, I, I definitely agree with you, what you're saying there. And I've gone through a similar process, having made like some short films and some music videos and stuff like that. Anything that you can kind of just try and do things with the camera so you can gain some experience. Um, but I feel like running a YouTube channel has been very similar to that way where you have to consistently put yourself out there to like the world on like a weekly basis. And people will say like, oh, your audio is rubbish or that point you made doesn't make any sense. And then you're kind of dealing with outside influences coming in and how do you react to that criticism and if you just continue doing that on a weekly basis you very quickly become used to um, getting that information and then being able to cope with it and deal with it either yeah. because the information gets better because you can accept feedback and, and change and make better quality videos um, or you just learn to thicken your skin a little bit and maybe don't absorb as much as, as you did before and so yeah, that's been... some of them aren't even worth responding to are yeah they? no some of them just total idiots yeah i mean uh, to be honest I, I i enjoy fucking with them to be <laughs> i do it all the time in the comment section of videos i get these trolls come on and they start saying these nasty things and they're obviously obviously just trying to just be nasty for the sake of it and i'll start playing mind games with them because i mean <laughs> what a lot of those people don't realize uh, at least when they're dealing with me is i spent 15 years working in mental health with the homeless with you know ex-cons drug addicts alcoholics I've met some real nasty, nasty people over the years, and I've dealt with them face to face. I've had these people threatening to punch my head in, um, threatening to come round to my house, and you know, it's. I've dealt with all that stuff in real life, and to have some idiots on the troll section trying to intimidate is just—it's comical. So, I like to mess around and play games with them, you know. <laughs> and I think it provides entertainment for the other pe the other people who are. Um, who were reading through the comment sections. I mean, they, they get a good laugh out of it as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It was interesting how you were saying about making um, short films and things like as part of your family like in a kind of young a younger set and that's quite interesting because I feel like I did a similar thing the first kind of ever like really short film that I made was um, do you remember those like uh, Nike basketball um, adverts and they would be like they would bounce and they would bounce and it, the bouncing would be the music track and they would kind of bounce and do like a freestyle move and then they would pass it to the left and it would cut yeah. out camera and it would come in from the other side and the next person would do a move I did that with my friends and we like edited it 
um, all in camera. So we would like the ball would go out the side of the screen and then we would cut and then the next person would yeah. move into position. And so just like fooling around doing things like that with your friends and figuring out how to use a camera and things like that was it was really fun and then watching the yeah. final product at the end of it it was like we just made this masterpiece that was like amazing <laughs> and it's just this like shoddy video that we made together um, yeah. but that's great to hear you had a similar thing growing up absolutely I mean having fun is so essential to learn and I mean as you probably uh, know from seeing the stuff on the website I've got a, a daughter now she's 16 months old and watching how much she learns from just playing and having fun is like, yeah, that's you got to keep that attitude as you grow older. Uh, like, like I said, I mean, we used to do comedy reenactments of videos when I was a kid. You know, my, my cousin uh, got dressed up with a shower cap and pretended to be the uh, shower murder victim in Psycho. <laughs> somebody was stabbing at him with a Lego knife through the, the <laughs> and somebody else is throwing blood on him. And you can see the hands coming in and throwing blood on him. You know, that kind of thing. It's just funny. loads of fun. I mean, you look, you look at the end product and you think there's so many mistakes there, but years later you think well hold on if i was actually shooting that scene i've got to look out for the hand that's coming in screen and throwing the blood and um, i've got to make sure that that doesn't look like a, a rubber or lego knife it needs to be shiny so i've got to put something you know coat it in some vaseline or something to give it some make it glisten you know um so yeah you do learn from it definitely um another thing we used to do when i was younger was um we got two VHS machines, um, and my dad had the leads to copy movies. You know, everyone used to go yeah, to the video yeah. store and rent movies. Well, we used to rent them and copy them. You know, it was illegal, but then we'd have our own copy, and that allowed me to watch movies again and again. Um, but <laughs> my dad had sussed out this thing where if we removed the audio lead and just recorded the picture and plugged the microphone into the second VHS machine, we could actually dub our own ad-lib dialogue over the oh, movie. That's so amazing. <laughs> with my cousins, we ended up doing it like our own comedy dialogue dubbed uh, version of Rambo. We did pretty much the whole movie, um, <laughs> all ad-libbed, you know. And, I mean, you would cry with laughter. If I had that video now, I'd... I'd put it all up on YouTube because I think it would get a lot of views. Um, yeah, I mean, we had a, quite a blast with that. But, I mean, but again, that teaches you about audio editing, you know, um, about syncing things up. And, um, you know, that's a, it, it's all learning. Just do as much as possible. Um, make it fun and allow yourself to just fail. Yeah, totally agree with you. And I think the the point that we're kind of talking about is you can't really fake um, curiosity and excitement when it comes to certain topics. And so when people have asked me for advice before, it's hard for me to tell them to do what I've done because that's just not going to work for everybody. So I kind of said to them, just follow whatever makes you excited, follow whatever your curiosity is, and then you'll just be naturally driven towards it. And then that will lead to um, educating yourself and then things will come from there, you know? Yeah. Well, again, I think part of that goes back to the thing of uh, what we were saying before about um, the, conf the confidence thing. I mean, these people who are contacting you and asking, how can I do what you do? What they're basically saying is, I know that what you do works, so how can I do it? Yeah. Um, and they feel comfortable with that because... They're, what they're asking for is to to tread to walk a path that somebody else has already walked, you know. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you can you can learn elements from other people in doing that, but if you don't branch off from that path yourself and try some new directions, you're not going really going to break any new ground. Um, and, and if if that's what you're going to do, then what's the point, you know? Um, I, I know, like with with your stuff, I've seen on your channel, you've you've been working on this thing, as you said before, about trying to find the, the the balance between doing the really in-depth long videos which take ages to do yeah and doing these really short videos and to be honest i haven't got that cracked either yet sometimes i'm going a month without making a new video because what i'm working on is too in-depth and takes ages to do and meanwhile the fan base are like well where are you you yeah. know um but you've done that thing where you know you do these must-see films and um I haven't watched a lot of them, but it seems that you've got you seem to have hit on a format that allows you to get material up more regularly than I do. Uh, and well done to you for doing that, you know. And that's an example of you branching out away from like whatever you've learned from me. Yeah. You know, um, well, that's 
I felt like a similar thing that you'd had before is just being like frustrated with making a film analysis video. And then for me, having made it, um, that wasn't my favorite part of it, studying and making it wasn't my favorite part. It was when you shared it and people started speaking about it in the comment section. So really yeah. for me, it was the back and forward with people that made it feel a bit more like a community. And so I thought if it's taking me like a month to make a video, then I don't get to do my favorite part for like another month. Um, yeah. So I wanted to make something that was like shorter, a bit more informal um, so that I could share on a more regular basis and then just be a bit more in touch with people. And so that's why I kind of created these podcast videos. And then as my confidence has grown, instead of just doing podcasts by myself, I've started reaching out to other kind of film enthusiasts and I've just recently been doing them similar to what we're doing right now. And, and that's been a, a huge step up for me because my favorite part being the conversation between me and other people. That's exactly what I get to do with these kind of uh, two people podcasts. Yeah. Um, but I understand the frustration because I felt that same thing with myself for ages. And it's how do you tackle that? You know? Well, I mean, there's another aspect of it for me, which is, uh, you know, adds more complexity and awkwardness to it is that a lot of people who um, spend a lot of time doing YouTube videos, they, they earn their money from the, uh, the, the, the clicks, you know, they, they, they have their monetized videos and, you know, so many clicks, they get so much money for it. Yeah. Um, and I've had some of these companies contact me, you know, to try and get my channels monetized. Um, but I, I look around at a lot of the people who've been doing that and I hear a lot of very bad reports, people saying that uh, they're not getting paid as much as they're supposed to. They log into their accounts uh, with these monetization schemes, and it turns out that half of the view count has disappeared. So again, they're not getting paid as much, and so on. I just don't trust it enough to do it that way. Yeah, uh, and I'm not convinced that I would really um, earn enough money from doing it that way. So I sell the DVD sets, um, yeah. and one of the things about the DVD sets for me is, um, I mean, I'm not an absolute raging capitalist. But I believe in the power of the marketplace. If people are willing to pay for what you are doing, then that is a, a really good confirmation that there's value in it, you know. Yep. Um, and, you know, sometimes I get people who just buy like one DVD set of mine because they want to sp see a specific video that is not available online. And that's great. And then other people will come along who've just discovered my work one day and suddenly they'll buy all of my material all at once. And it's like, oh, there's 180 pounds worth of stuff all just sold to one new person. Nice. Doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen now and then. Um, and that kind of feedback lets me know that, uh, you know, there's a marketplace there and that the stuff is really valued. I do believe if people aren't willing to pay at least something for what you're doing, then it's probably not that great, you know. Yeah. Um, I know there's all the arguments of people. People now expect everything for free online anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm a big believer in that. So I've got the the added complexity of which videos do I put online and which videos do I just put on DVD sets. Uh, okay. uh, yep. If I devote yeah. if I devote too much time to making a DVD set, I can end up going three months without putting a video online. So that's no good. So I have to balance it out. You know, um, and that, that's an, another thing. I, I mean, I know some people don't really appreciate it. Um, online but i've started doing some shorter videos um and putting the longer versions as dvd only you know uh, that's another way of doing it yeah that's quite a good idea actually i thought about doing that with commentaries actually about giving like the first 10 15 minutes to a commentary and then selling like a commentary bundle of like five films together yeah i haven't quite got around to that but that's maybe something i'll do in the future um, but I want to be respectful of your time. So what I'd quite like to do is maybe just hit you with some rapid fire questions okay. and, then, and then you can just take as long or as little time on them as you like. Sure. So the first would be if you had to choose a film out of these three, what would you choose between the King of Comedy, Taxi Driver and Rage and Bull? Uh, would I choose for what as being the best film? Just uh, a personal favorite. Maybe, uh, maybe I'd have to go for Taxi Driver out of those three. Um, and then I would go for King of Comedy. Uh, nice. I only saw that for the first time about four months ago, and it was very interesting. Yeah. 
Well, that's interesting. This is the reason that I asked this question is because I want to see if anybody ever puts King of Comedy first because I really feel that that gets overshadowed a lot by Taxi Driver and that um, it's still a pretty an amazing quality film. Um, yeah. And I really liked it when I saw it and I thought you couldn't make that film these days because it's so dark. And, uh-huh. um, so- oh, it is. It's really... I found it quite disturbing to watch because there's so much truth in it about the shallowness of... Uh, you know those people. <laughs> yeah, and it's, um, it's almost more true nowadays, given how um, social media has kind of like taken over the world, and you can see that working in today's setting almost as well. You know. Well, just uh, before we move on from that, um, yeah. I mean, my instant choice of Taxi Driver there was because I've already done a, uh, a one-hour film analysis of that anyway, so I've studied that film to death, so I already know that there's a hell of a lot going on in that movie. King of Comedy, I've only seen once, uh, and it really was interesting uh, um, and dark as hell, but definitely worthy of film analysis. Yeah, I would say so. Um, Second question is, if you had like a theme song to your life, like if you're in a really good mood and you're strutting down the street, do you have like a specific song you would like to have as your your theme tune for your life? Oh God, that's a tough one. (laughs) Um, I'll tell you what springs to mind. Uh, I actually used to use this one in my head quite a lot when I needed to be confident, like if I was going for a job interview. Yeah. Because uh, I used to study a lot of NLP, you know, the neuro linguistic programming, yeah, yeah. and use little mind tricks on myself and stuff like that. And yeah, if I was going for job interviews and I was feeling a little bit nervous, I used to play the, the music from the elevator scene in Aliens. You know, when Ripley's getting tooled up oh, with all okay. the, gun, yeah, the yeah. guns and the flamethrower and you got the drums going and it's like, well, it's building up and building up and she's totally empowered. I used to play that music in my mind when I needed confidence, yeah. Nice, that's a good answer. Um, when you hear the word filmmaker, who's the first person that jumps into your mind? Kubrick. Kubrick. Um, it's funny because we've had so many different answers to that question. Like some people have said Hitchcock because he kind of has the image as a director. A couple of Spielbergs have jumped up. And then for me, it would probably be Kubrick. Do you, do you have a reason why? Or is that just the first person that came to you? Actually, Kubrick and Lynch came at the same time in answer to that one. Um, I would pick Kubrick and Lynch because they seem to make the films in which they had the most control and were expressing the most in their movies compared to anyone else. You know, the, the, the movies that they made were their movies. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny talking about Lynch, like a lot of people like his very Lynchian work, like Mulholland Drive and things like that. But I like his actually tamed slightly a work. Like I like um, Straight Story and Elephant Man a little bit more just, great movies, yeah, really great movies, and they're my favorite of his, to be honest. Rather than some yeah. of his Stranger stuff, um, and I mean, I just... they, they do show. It's interesting <coughs> those those movies show that. I mean, a lot of people think Lynch is, um, you know, the, especially the people who can't be bothered looking beyond the surface. They look at his crazy stuff and they think, oh, this filmmaker doesn't know what he's doing. Well, go and look at the Elephant Man. It's a perfectly well-made, straight narrative movie. It's not historically accurate. The Elephant Man was a good businessman in real life, apparently. Um, <laughs> but it works perfectly well dramatically. It's well acted and all that, you know. And if I remember rightly, there was various awards that the film was up for. David Lynch is perfectly capable of making a normal, straightforward narrative movie. It's just not the way he chooses to do it all the time. Yeah, for me, I really like uh, Blue Velvet. It feels like that's the kind of perfect balance between yeah. actually telling a, a straight narrative story as well as um, having some of the, his really stylistic work in there as well. And so I've done an analysis on Blue Velvet, but I think only because it has that balance of both things and it's yeah. so easy to watch. And so I like it for that reason. Plus some of the ins- that, insane performances. That, that's the general fan favorite is Blue Velvet, isn't it? I think it's for that very reason. I mean, Mulholland Drive and Lost Highway you can't really, although they're quite sort of Hollywood in the way that they're shot and they they, they look quite nice and stuff, you know, it's um, and they're, they're quite dramatic in places. It, they're not straight narrative movies. You can't just watch them with a simple mind, uh, but you can with Blue Velvet for some reason, you know, it's... Uh, yeah. yeah, I agree. Um, so I just wondered here, this might kind of bring us back to the same people we've just mentioned, but if who is a director that you would like to have a conversation with, like living or dead? Like if you could sit and actually pick the brains of this of this man's head who or woman's head, who, who would you choose? Yeah, right, okay. Now, I'm not going to say Kubrick 
because I don't think he'd tell me everything I wanted to know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he'd just <laughs> laugh and not answer. Um, let's see, who would be... Oh, just give me a moment to think about that one. Um, possibly Paul Verhoeven. Right, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, because he's a really, really good director in terms of he was able to make these incredibly commercial movies that everybody loved. But when you look at stuff like Starship Troopers, it's like, wow, there is actually a lot of intelligence and depth going on for this guy as well. Uh, and Robocop as well. I mean, I did a uh, film analysis of that recently, and there's all kinds going on in that movie. Um, actually, I, I'm going to cheat on answering this. I would pick the team of Paul Verhoeven and the writer Ed Neumeyer, who wrote Robocop and Starship Troopers, because that direction and uh, writing team of those two uh, I think was ideal for, for creating movies that are both commercial and artistic. So I'd love to sit and chat with those two. Nice. That'd be an amazing conversation. Um, yeah. And so what I really I like to do at the end of podcast to kind of bring it to a close is I'd like to suggest a film that's been on my mind recently um, to the audience, maybe like a hidden gem or something that you've seen recently that's kind of struck you. Um, and so I just wonder if there's anything that you'd seen recently that you wanted to share or maybe recommend to people. Oh... Right, again, I'll have to think a moment to that one. Are you talking recent movies or older ones or what? It's up to you. Sometimes it's great to see, or like I've seen a new movie like Whiplash has just came out of the cinema or like take it right back to like a hidden gem that people may have never even heard of before but something that you yeah. think is, is worthy of watching. Okay, uh, let's see. There's one that springs to mind that I did watch a little while ago. Um I can't oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. I know Gene Hackman was in it. It was an old 70s movie. Damn. <laughs> I can't remember the name of it. I think it was called Night Moves, actually. Right. Uh, Night Moves with Gene Hackman, like a detective uh, film noir. Um, very paranoid movie, lots of weird twists. Um, yeah, Night Moves with Gene Hackman. Nice. Awesome. I think people yeah. forget actually how amazing Gene Hackman is. Like I watched him, what was it I watched him in recently? Uh, I can't remember what it was, but he's actually an amazing actor. And you forget how, just because he hasn't been in that many recent films, he's an incredible American actor. Yeah, he is really good. I mean, a, a big fan of him is Lex Luthor as well. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> he says, uh, one, of, one of my favorite lines of his is, um, uh, everybody's got their faults, mine's in California, you know, because he's going to blow <laughs> California up along the fault. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> Hackman's funny. great. great. Well, it was um, just uh, before we move on there, just on Hackman, I, I, I found it quite funny. I was watching um, the, what what was the, the detective movie he did that was really famous? That There was a director of The Exorcist. Um, the one that he did with Will Smith? No, 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 no. It was a... An older one. Oh, the French uh, one, the French... Uh, French Connection. The French, French Connection, connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first one, yeah. I mean, the second one was good as well, but The French Connection is a great movie. I'm sure you've seen that, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was watching some of the interviews with the director of that one. Um, again, people's names are popping out of it. Um, Billy Friedkin, that was it, was the director. Um, <laughs> Billy Friedkin was saying in these interviews... That he thought Gene Hackman was a crap actor. I mean, he just <laughs> didn't mince his words. He was go. He was saying, "I did not want this guy in this movie. The guy can't act." And blah 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 blah. I don't know why he couldn't stand Gene Hackman as the lead in his movie. But I thought Hackman <laughs> was great in it. But uh, Friedkin um, is another one who I'd love to have a conversation with because he's just so in your face, you know. It's funny because I suppose when they were making that film, they never realized how much it would stand the test of time and be a bit of a classic mm -hmm. down the line. That's funny. Um, so I just wanted to wrap up here. This would be the kind of last question and anything else you want to say is if you could offer your younger filmmaking self any advice, um, what would it be? And I know we've spoke a lot of things about confidence and, and um, we've actually spoke about a lot of things of this, but I'm thinking just also for myself to be kind of selfish is I'm planning to make my first kind of low budget feature, which is will be the longest thing outside of music videos and shorts that I've ever made. And so just trying to tackle that new problem with um, as much um, preparation Preparation and, and knowledge as possible. Just if you had any advice in that area. Yeah, I have got a bit of advice, and it's not an easy one to follow. Um, 
I was saying before about uh, laziness uh, with a lot of people. Um, <sighs> filmmaking is hard work. You know, it's uh, it takes so much preparation and time to do, and you have to be committed enough to it that you're willing to sacrifice other things in your life. Um, I mean, you need to be able to say, right, I'm not going to get drunk for three months. I'm not going to waste money on holidays for six months. I'm not going to do this. You have to set aside a load of things and say, right, my filmmaking is more important than that. Um, if you don't do that, you won't have the time and resources to make a movie unless somebody else has come along and magically given you all the money. But I've never met anybody who that's actually happened to. <laughs> no, me neither. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's got to be... Uh, it's got to be priority. It's it's a lot of hard work, and it's the same with the, the film analysis stuff you're talking about. I mean, yeah. you know how, how much effort it takes to make uh, the kinds of videos that you do, and when people are writing to you and asking how do you do it, and you tell them, and they say, "Well, I know that." What they were actually asking for was, "How do I do it in an incredibly easy and effortless way?" Yeah, exactly. Change your <laughs> question. Like, Sorry, no. Do the hard work. If you're not prepared to do the hard work, then forget it. You know. Um. Yeah, I mean, actually, if I was going to go back and advise my younger self, assuming that my younger self had access to all the technology that we've got now, yeah. um, I would have restructured and reorganized pretty much my whole life in order to facilitate filmmaking. I would have lived and breathed filmmaking. Um, I mean, I would have had some fun and laughs as well, but I wouldn't have bothered um, – going and getting part-time jobs, working with the mentally ill and things like that, which I've done. I mean, even though those things have taught me a lot, they have detracted a lot from the filmmaking as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, commitment. Commitment and sacrifice, yeah. Yeah, and I know exactly what you mean. And, and, and I felt that same frustration because, you, you know, I, I have like a, a full-time job as well as trying to juggle things at this channel and then trying to juggle the passion of making a film and things. And it's how do you get that balance between like committing yourself and your soul to something that you truly believe in, but then even trying to find the resources and time to do that is like a yes. really, really big challenge, you know. Well, what, what I had to do on that one, because, I mean, I reached a point um, maybe about, a year ago, year and a half ago, where suddenly I was earning enough from the DVD sales to be able to um, do this stuff full time yep. and not have to work. I mean, it's been up and down. You know, sometimes I earn enough, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I suddenly earn a lot. Um, and now I've got a baby to look after as well, which makes things <laughs> that's another thing. Yeah. Wait until later to have a baby, <laughs> um, which I'm glad I did. Um, <clears throat> what was I going to say there? Uh, priorities slipped my mind whatever it was uh, uh, what was I just saying what's my train of thought so you were talking about clearing things so that you could um, prioritise things in your life yeah I guess I must have just summed it up I'm sure there was something <laughs> else I was going to add but I can't remember No, that's, that's going to play on your mind now isn't it? I know it's like what was that golden, <laughs> what golden was, nugget of information yeah. <laughs> that's right that's like that scene have you ever seen it's not a great film but in Ocean's 12 when Brad Pitt is talking to Matt Damon and he's like Wh whatever, you're, whatever you do don't forget this wait what about and he changes conversation and he leaves and then Matt Damon's like what what are you talking about uh, it's a hilarious little moment by the way um, your film that you're putting together what, what stage are you at in that now so, so I'm the. I feel like I'm the, the same as a lot of people in the way that um, I wrote. I wrote the script and I wrote a a draft of the script and I'm working on the second draft and so there needs to be more writing so that at least that's of quality before we even begin. But my plan for me is to shoot it in kind of July time. So I'm thinking about six months from now, and. Um, for me with the script like we were talking about priorities is I couldn't just fit, find time to finish it so I mm. went on to this website called um, stick.com and it's like s-t-i-c-k-k dot com and basically you, you submit your goal so I want to finish the script by the end of October and then you submit like a, a, a chunk of your money and you assign one of your friends as the referee and if mm. you don't finish it by October your friend is responsible for sending your money to like a charity or like an anti anti charity, so that your yeah. your name is attached to this terrible cause forever, and so that was the thing that actually got me to finish the first draft, is because there was like a consequence, there was a deadline, there was something that that ha had to be finished. Yeah, and I felt like if that deadline wasn't there, I would have just kind of got round to it, and it never would have happened, you know. 
Well, there's one little bit of advice that I'll give. I, I used to do some filmmaking workshops here in Liverpool. There was filmmaking groups I used to go to. <clears throat> and the most important workshop that I would do with people, um, it's totally essential for anybody making a film in any uh, situation. And that is to sit down with pen and paper and write down every possibility of what can go wrong with your film shoot. And it's amazing the list that you can come up with. Oh, you know, this, this actor might walk out, the camera might get broken, this piece of equipment will get lost, and you'll be surprised at the thousands of things that you end up writing down. Once you've done that, then you've got to <laughs> sort of <laughs> categorise according to likeliness. I mean, getting struck by lightning and hit by meteors is unlikely, yeah. but you'll find Could a hell happen. of a lot of things on the on the list. There is a good chance of them happening, and if you don't have uh, provisions in place, then there could be disaster. Um, I tend to work with that principle. I mean, when I shot Turn in Your Grave, I had a ton of contingency things in place for various things that might go wrong, um, and they came in very handy. If I didn't have that that huge list things would have fell apart and it wouldn't have got the film done. Right. That's interesting. I'm definitely going to have to go through that mind boggle and yeah. process. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. Well, no, thanks for the advice. And so just to wrap up, I guess, where's the best place for people to um, check out your work? Is it uh, one of your YouTube channels? Uh, the website, really. You know, just uh, Google Rob Egan and go to the website or the YouTube. YouTube channel. I mean, basically, those are the two things that show up first, anyway. Um, I, th I think most people just start with the YouTube channel. You know, just uh, take a look at any of the videos on there, and if, if if you don't like what you see, you probably won't like the other ones. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. I'll the, sorry, the web the website, by the way, for those of your uh, people who are watching your stuff who aren't familiar with my stuff, is collativelearning.com. If, if you can get that up on you as a link on your your video version, that would be appreciated. Yeah, no problem. I'll put both those, um, your website and your YouTube video in the description below will be the first two links um, so that people can find your stuff there. But uh, cool. you know, a huge thanks for sharing with the community because I'm sure they um, enjoyed this conversation because a lot of people who have found um, my work, have, I'm sure have seen a lot of your work and are interested in that same kind of niche of film analysis. Um, and so a big thanks for coming on and sharing with the community. All right, thanks. Cheers, Darren. No I'll problem. see you again. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation there with Rob and I was so happy to be able to connect the dots between the work I do here on Must See Films and the origin of its influence with the work of Rob. And be sure to check out Rob's work on his YouTube channels and his uh, website which will be below in the description. And if you'd like to support the work I do here at Must See Films to help bring you more videos of better quality and more frequently then give whatever you can at my Patreon page which is below in the description. And since Must See Films has always been a bit of back and forth, a dialogue about films, feel free to join the Facebook and the Twitter and get yourself engaged in these conversations. And a big thank you for listening.